we're talking about how to get good with money even when times are tough. Although our nation's unemployment rate has been dropping since the height of the pandemic, millions of Americans are considered long-term unemployed. That's 27 weeks or more. Being unemployed and feeling financially strapped for an extended period of time can negatively affect your life in so many ways. But that low point can also propel you to levels you've never dreamed of. And our guest today is living proof of that. Tiffany Aliche, aka The Budget Nista, is the author of Get Good With Money and an award-winning financial educator who has transformed the lives of over one million women worldwide. She regularly appears as a financial expert on the real daytime talk show and co-hosts the top-ranked financial podcast, Brown ambition. Tiffany also co-founded an online school, the Live Richer Academy, which teaches women worldwide how to take their finances to the next level and achieve their personal goals. When Tiffany isn't helping women achieve their financial goals, she's spending time with her husband and stepdaughter in New Jersey. Welcome to the show, Tiffany. Thank you for having me, Andy. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. Well, let's let's talk about your backstory a little bit. You've helped millions of women. I just told everybody that with improving their financial lives. Where did you first learn to get good with money? So I was fortunate, Andy, to grow up. Well, at the time, it didn't seem fortunate, but my dad was a he was an accountant and a CFO. And he never wasted a moment to teach my sisters and I about money, whether it was to break down how much every toilet flush cost when we were in there playing as kids, like one, two, he's like, that's 10 cents, that's 20 cents. <laughs> or whether it was having me do the family's budget when I wanted a bike when I was 10. He was like, this is what me and mom make. This is how much me and mom spend. This is what we need to save. This is what's left over. So he had like the calculator that had the paper coming out of the back, which I loved. And so learning like, oh, you pay a mortgage? You don't pay for a house the way you pay for a shirt one time. And so understanding that and then picking a bike based upon the fact that I realized, you know what? If I get the bike that I truly want, which was this little purple Barbie bike, I'm going to grow out of it next year. And then we'll have to do this again. And I might not want a bike for my 11th birthday. So I chose a bike I could grow into. And we still have that bike to this day. That's where I learned about money. It was it was teachable moments at home. But then my mom was like the practical money person. And she would take us food shopping and clothes shopping and show us how she navigated um, that. So I guess when you raise, because we were five girls, so you can only imagine the expense. <laughs> and so just, I was fortunate. I grew up at home with it. I love it. And then, you know, you 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 weren't always the budget Nista. So what, what did you mm -hmm. do for a living as you took this money information from your parents and applied that into your life? What did you do for a living after after college, I guess? So for college, I thought I was going to go into like, you know, the corporate world, but I honestly really loved teaching. And because of my financial like upbringing, I realized that I could be a teacher and still be financially OK. So that's the that's what's so awesome about you know, learning financial education at home, I got to choose a profession that I love versus one that had to pay me a whole lot of money. So I became a teacher, a preschool teacher. And I love that. I, I did that for 10 years. But even while I was there, um, Andy, I found myself like showing parents how to budget. I, I knew how to do my own taxes since I was like 18 because my father showed me. So I would literally, when, when kids would go to sleep, we would for during nap time because they were preschoolers, I would have parent university and parents would come in and we would do their taxes together. We would do their budget savings plans, showing them how to open up bank accounts. And so I I love not just teaching kids, but adults as well. And I did that for, for 10 years until the 2008 recession hit. Um, and my school was nonprofit based. And so they lost their funding and all the teachers, we lost our jobs. Oh man, what a tough time. Yeah, a lot of people got hit hard during that great recession time. Obviously there's a lot of parallels to what we're seeing today yes. with our economy and, and your situation. So you became unemployed during that situation. What, what did you do to survive financially? So I, like so many people now, I was on unemployment and um, I honestly couldn't afford my mortgage. So I stopped paying it. I, I remember reaching out to the bank and like trying to get assistance. It's not like now where I'm so glad they have systems in place, but then the banks were like, I don't care. <laughs> There was no moratorium where they're like, okay, six months, no payment. No, it was like um, either, you know, give me my money or you, you have to get out. And so what I did was I did get out and I rented 
my condo out. I bought it when I was 25. So that way I was hoping that I could rent it out to make the, the mortgage. But unfortunately, I rented it out to a friend who also lost their job. And so now I was living at home in my middle school bed and I have a condo that I cannot kick my friend out of in a mortgage that I still can't pay. It was it was probably the darkest times. I, I know I it sounds lighthearted now, but I wasn't a kid. I remember I was 30. I was 30 years old, back in my middle school bedroom with a tenant that I could not remove, with a house I could not afford and worried about foreclosure every day and still jobless. Because the problem with um, losing your job as a teacher in the beginning of the school year, teaching is not one of those jobs that they can open the classroom without a teacher. They already had teachers in place. So it wasn't like they were like, oh, all you 20 teachers, you know, there's all these opportunities available for you. There weren't. And so it was a really scary um dark time because I had student loan debt, 50 something thousand dollars. I had credit card debt because I'd been a victim of a scam that they found me like still responsible for because it was a mistake that I made, but still it was a scam nonetheless, $35,000. And I had a a mortgage for uh, $220,000, so almost $300,000 in debt and, and no income. So it was a very scary time. Wow. So you were $300,000 in the hole living mm-hmm. at home, going through a credit card scam. Mm-hmm. How did you, I guess, what was the moment? What helped you create a turning point to climb out of this tough spot? It, it took something emotionally and mentally in me. So what happened was I was hiding from all my friends. I didn't want to tell anyone because I was ashamed. And if you're listening, you might feel to yourself, like I am experiencing financial shame as well. And what I realized is that the problem with shame is that shame is a liar. Shame says you're a mistake, not that you made a mistake, you know, and shame actually gets stronger the more silent you are. Shame thrives in your loneliness. Shame thrives in you not telling anyone that you're struggling. And so that's what I was doing, that I was, the more I pulled away, the stronger the shame got. And it wasn't until my best friend, Linda, at the time, she had been calling me back to back to back for some weeks. And finally I picked up. And um, she's like, how was everything? I was going to lie and say everything was fine, but I just burst out in an emotional outburst and told her everything. I said, you know, I lost my job. I'm losing my home. The tenant is not paying. You know, I don't have any money. I took, by then I had taken all the money from my retirement account to try to save the house. Went through that. That was gone. I said, I had more money at 16 when I used to babysit than at 30. And I'm still living in the same room that I was at 16. And she actually started laughing. I said, well, I found to see what's so funny. And she was like, Tiffany, welcome to the world. Everybody's having a hard time. And shame also makes you feel like you're alone. So I looked around and I realized that like, it's a recession and so many people are losing their homes. And honestly, up until then, I was strong financially. And she was like, in our 20s, all of our friends struggle financially, but not you. You were always really good with your money. So this is your first time feeling this this pinch. But honestly, welcome to the real world. We've been feeling this pinch for the last mm, (laughs) 10 years. And so when she said that, one, I got to release the shame because the way you release shame is by giving it voice, by sharing the thing out loud that you're afraid of to say. And so once I released it, it allowed me to also see the solutions that were in front of me. I realized that I'd grown up with this amazing foundation. I knew how to budget. I knew how to save. I knew how to work, you know, like I knew how to live super frugally. And so honestly, Andy was one step in front of the other. I was like, okay, well, what do you have coming in? You have unemployment coming in. By then I finally was able to get my friend out and had a tenant that was paying. Um, But by then the bank refused to take my, um, refused to take my mortgage because they said they wanted me to pay the back pay of $80,000, which who had that? So they wouldn't take the month to month, even though I could afford the month to month. So I said, okay. So the money that my, 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 my new tenant was paying, I added that and said, okay, so now you've got unemployment, you've got your rent money. I was babysitting, I was tutoring, and I slowly but surely, I used a snowball method to start chipping away at my debt, you know, and I stayed home. And then once I couldn't take staying home, I moved in with my sister onto her couch. So it took me two years, but I chipped away and paid off that unemployment, that, um, that uh, credit card debt. Um, then my student loan debt, I said, student loans, forbearance for you because I just don't have $50,000, you know? And then that's when I started to grow the budget Nista because I asked myself, you know, what is it that you want now, Tiffany? Like I really loved teaching. I'm adverse to, to challenges, right? I am someone who is normally fearful of change. But what I learned was that what I thought was a safe job, which is teaching because teachers don't lose their jobs, that that's actually not safe. 
if I was only choosing to teach in that way because it was safe, I was living less of a life. So I told myself, if nothing is truly safe, what would you go after? And I said, I think I would start something on my own. So I started my my financial education firm, The Budget Nista, and it wasn't easy. It was probably four years of like really hard work that yielded no real money. But here I am, you know, I, I built something really strong. I paid off all of my debts. I ended up losing my home to foreclosure, but even that was a good thing because I it was just too much of a burden and I was never going to catch up with the fees. The house I live in now, my husband and I were able to pay for it cash. It was a foreclosure, so it's full circle. So we got it 50% off and we renovated it. Uh, we were able to pay off my parents' house a couple of years ago, which was like super full circle, you know, because, you know, I'm sure they were looking at me 30 back home, like what happened? <laughs> I remember because my, my mom had wanted to retire. She was a nurse. My father had already retired as the CFO of a small nonprofit. And so I asked her what was keeping her from retiring. She's like, honestly, you know, we we um, took money out of the mortgage because uh, my sister Lisa is a baby and they paid for her to go to school. And they were like, we got a second mortgage, you know, to pay for Lisa's college. And I said, she's like, but if, if it wasn't for that, we'd be fine. And I said, well, how much, you know, how much is the mortgage? And they told me it was $120,000. I'll never forget. And I said, okay. My dad was like, okay, what? I said, okay. Because I'd already spoken to my husband. I was like, we, we already knew what our max was that we could help with. I was like, you know, we're going to pay it off. And he's like, I don't understand. <laughs> he was like, I don't understand. And I was like, no, like I told you that, you know, it took some time, but the budget needs to be doing well. I'm going to pay it off. He was like, but won't that bankrupt you? I'm like, daddy, you did not raise me. What do I look like? <laughs> I'm like, no, it's not going to bankrupt me. But I could tell that he was like, mm, I don't believe it. So it was like a Friday. And so on Monday, I called the, you know, the mortgage company. I, gave, I got all the paperwork he gave me. And I, I, you know, I sent the money and paid it off. And I could just tell he didn't believe me that he called me like, I just called for my balance. This is my 20th time calling for my balance. And it keeps saying zero. I don't understand. <laughs> I know it still honestly like brings tears to my eyes, but he, he just can't believe it. He was just like, I, I just don't believe it. I'm like, but this is, I truly believe that you reap what you sow. These are the seeds he sowed into me, you know, because he could have not taught me about finance. He could have not taught me how to save and invest and, and budget and, and live uh, frugally when need be. But he did. And as a result, it, you know, it led to me being able to do this for them. So it's just, just so many of us like, you know, we would love to be able to say, you know, I was able to um, take care of my parents in this way. And but I told him, too, that there are other that he is not just my father in finance, that because of me, there are literally over a million women who might not have learned money at home, not at school. And through me, because of him, they, so I'm like, you have been the father of finance for all of these women. And they tell me that they're like, tell your dad, I said, thank you. <laughs> Cause he set that foundation for me. And so, yeah, I'm just really proud of like what, you know, how far it's taken me. I've only ever been two things, the budget, uh, preschool teacher and the budget Nisa. I truly believe the purpose of life is to live a life of service. And so that's why I teach financial education. That's why I wrote Get Good With Money. As I was struggling through, I wish that there was a guide that was relevant to what I needed, that didn't talk over me. I wanted a guy that was actually also going to walk me through step by step by step. That wasn't going to assume I knew a thing, you know, but it was going to walk me through step by step by step. That was going to be fun and energetic, but also kind, because there's a lot of judgment in personal finance now, Andy. I don't know if you noticed, um, right? I didn't feel like shaming someone was going to be the way to help. And so, um, so once I got myself together, I promised that I was going to help other people. That's why I'm so excited about Get Good With Money, because it is that guide. It's this 10-step guide that walks you through starting with budgeting, ending with estate planning. Like all these 10 steps work together for what I call financial wholeness. Financial freedom is cool, but it's not enough because yes, you can have enough money not to work anymore. So like, and you're like, oh, okay, I don't have to work anymore, but that's not enough because what if you don't have to work anymore because you have a pile of money, but are you fully insured? Or you don't have to work anymore because you have a pile of money, but you don't have an estate plan and something happens to you, what happens to your children? Or somehow you don't have to work anymore because maybe you won the lottery, but you know, but you don't actually know, know how to earn. You don't know how to turn that money and make it into more money. You don't know how to manage that money wisely and, and budget with it. You don't know how to save. You don't know how to invest. And so that's what financial wholeness is. It's, it's these 10 steps that come together for what I call your greatest good, your biggest benefit, and your richest life, that it's beyond financial freedom. 
And financial wholeness is something that everyone can achieve. Not everyone will achieve financial freedom. Not everyone will have that pile of money and won't have to work, but everyone can achieve financial wholeness. I love it. I love it. And you've been a teacher throughout. Yes, a preschool teacher as well as budget nista and also, you know, taking those lessons from your father and keeping that teaching me methodology going. Let's talk yes. about this because I, I love these 10 steps and I love how you can walk people through it. A big part of your success is figuring out how to take your talents and make more money. So talk to me yes. through it because we because we breezed over it a little bit. You went from babysitting <laughs> to now I'm paying off my mortgage, my, my parents mortgage. <laughs> so let's talk about those those things that you started to do to build your business. What did you do in the beginning to start those seeds? In the beginning, when you're starting your business, I want you to think about and this is what I did. I said, OK, I don't have any money to invest into the business. So I'm going to look for what I call direct return on investment, meaning let's just say that I was really good at baking cakes. A direct return on investment is I will only spend money on the flour, the sugar. So because that's a direct return because what I can do is I will take those ingredients, literally bake the cake, and I can sell the cake, get my money right back, right? An indirect return would be to build a website, you know, to get the business cards. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do those things, but in the beginning, when I first started the Budgetista, I said, okay, you don't have much money, but... One thing you are really good at is you're good at budgeting, you're good at saving, you're good at paying down debt, you're good at fixing your credit. What if I can help people one on one and the cost would just be the gas to go meet them? You know, or even better yet, I would ask sometimes people to meet me at the library that was around the corner so I could walk. So I would literally walk to the library, meet people, and they would pay me anywhere from fifty to seventy five dollars to sit down for a couple of hours to work through their budget. And I was like, Okay, you have proof of concept. People want financial education, but one-on-one -on -one is not going to be enough. So I started to ask myself, how do I go from one-on-one, -on -one, which is limiting? Because I remember my first goal was if I could just make 500 bucks a month, if I just make 500 bucks a month. And I said, okay, 500 bucks a month is approximately five to six people a month. So I was like, okay, that's like one and a half people a week. Okay, I can do that. But what if I want to make $2,000 a month? Now we're looking at like 12 people a month. And then what if I want to make 10,000? That's almost impossible with the, with the methodology I was using. So I thought next step, Andy, is one to few. So few would mean, how do I get a bunch of people to pay me at the same time? And I realized it wasn't necessarily a bunch of people, but I started to connect with different organizations. Like the United Way was the first one. My mentor at the time told me, you need to go and get a contract. And I was like, how do you do that? She's like, that's all I got for you. <laughs> I was like, okay. And I, because I had done so much volunteer work, I reached out to some of the agencies that I'd volunteered for, United Way, Boys and Girls Club, and so I asked them, I said, you know, I've been teaching financial education and volunteering, but this is a business that I have. I would love to do a program. And because I was a teacher, um, they said, sure, you, you know, do you have a curriculum? And I knew how to write curriculum. I have my master's in education. So I put together a six week curriculum for the United Way of Greater Newark. And they hired me. And instead of one person paying me, you know, $75 to, you know, 50 to $75 to sit down with them, the United Way was like, for every session, we'll give you 500 so same time period, instead of 75, 500. I was like, yes, you know? So I was like, okay, that's the one to few. And so I did one a week. So it was like, okay, now I went from, you know, $500 a month to now $500 a week. And I said, okay, that's one to few. What if I want to do one to many? What does that look like? So you see, I started to ramp up and one to many, I realized like, well, instead of 20 people in the classroom, is there a bigger arena? I remember at the time, one of my friends, his brother had just become class president of his college. And he was, his friend was telling his brother like, oh, you know, Tiffany teaches financial education. And his brother was like, oh, you should come t um, do something for like, you know, with college students. And I said, okay, well, do you guys pay? He was like, yeah, is, is $1,500 enough? I was like, yeah. <laughs> and so all of a sudden that same two hours, instead of 50 bucks, instead of 500, it was now 1500 because I did one to many. And then I started to think, well, what's one to infinite? So what does that look like? And so I realized that the only way to do that is to do online teaching. And so I started teaching online because, you know, there's no, I can have as many people as possible as long as I have the bandwidth, as far as like, you know, my online um, access. And so I started an online school called the Live Richer Academy. And now we've got like, over 40,000 students. And that online school um, uh, makes just about um, eight figures, $10 million a year. Because what people do, Andy, is they get stuck in a place like, I could still be doing one-on-ones. That's limiting. I have to ask myself, well, how do I multiply myself? Hmm, more people in front of me. Okay, the classroom, well, how do I multiply myself? Huh, a college, way more people in front of me. Well, how do I multiply myself? Huh, okay, now 
you know, the school. And now with the school, I actually have instructors. So I don't even have to teach, you know, but it started with, you know, that one. So there's nothing wrong with starting with that one to one. If, if just you baking the cake. But you have to ask yourself, OK, I'm only one person. How many cakes can I really make in a month? Is there a way that I can multiply how many cakes? Yes, I can make the cakes more expensive. Maybe I hire other bakers. Maybe I have additional ovens, then other bakeries, and then I can mail cakes. And then but do you see you start to start to ramp up, um, you know, what you're able and capable of, of doing? And so, yeah, in 10 years, I went from preschool teacher to I own several businesses. But yeah, 10 million dollars a year, which is crazy. That is incredible. And yeah, I love the way you talked about scaling it, maybe getting yourself used to the one on one saying, I've yes. got this, I'm a teacher, mm -hmm. I can do it. Okay, now from a business standpoint, what can I do to scale it? I've got the confidence, I got the curriculum, how yes. can I make the money that will really not only change my life, but change yes. my parents lives and the lives of millions of other people who are a part of my network. So you've mm -hmm. got this situation right now, you are, uh, you've hired people to be the teachers where do you see your business going in the future what excites you as you move forward because you I, I guess let me let, first question when mm -hmm. when was the first time uh, th this this negative three hundred thousand dollars your, your net worth mm -hmm. at the time when was that how long ago was that that was i was negative three hundred thousand i'm 41 now yeah. and i was i would say because i actually lost the house so i would say i was 30 between 30 to 33 i was in that i was negative three hundred. so this 000. is less mm -hmm. than 10 years uh, that we're mm -hmm. talking about here so you mm -hmm. went you went from a negative three hundred thousand dollars situation to owning an eight figure business in less than ten yes. years. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. That, crazy? that <laughs> is incredible. That is but incredible. I will say, Andy, what I what I one thing I've learned is that like it's layers, right, of a cake. So at first, the first layer, I'm not gonna lie, the first four or five years, it was like nothing. I didn't, especially the first three years, no money came in. I was still kind of one on one, and I won't say no money, but it was I was still a little bit one on one. And for the first three years, I was in the classroom at the United Way, two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars a month. So not, you know, not no money, but certainly not enough to like, you know, live lavishly. Not that I live lavishly now, but, you know, but meaning like the first three years I had to learn a lot of what I'm doing now. I actually worked out in real time with individual people and in that classroom when it was just a handful of us. Like, does that work? And this is why I'm so excited about my book, Get Good With Money, because I got to work out with real people, like, does that make sense? Does this, you know, is this easier for you? You know, because the, the teacher in me is always checking for understanding. And am I teaching in a way that's fluid? Am I teaching in a way that makes sense to you? Am I teaching in a way that that transforms? You know, because to teach, to truly teach is to transform. And so I'm grateful for those three years of really not making much. I wasn't making much, but I was learning a ton. And then soon before I realized that, I'm like, okay, this is really good, Tiffany. Like, these programs that you've built, they've been vetted over the last, because I, I started my my um, online school maybe like I want to say um, like four four or five years ago. So it been it, it my like my my theories had been vetted for like five years. So I wasn't wondering like oh I don't know like I'm jumping into the school. No 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 no. I had real people, hundreds and hundreds of people, you know, go through my programs and realize like yes it does transform lives. So by the time the school came, I didn't have to learn the the how do I transform lives part? It was more so how do I, you know, learn to, to, to run ads? How do I, um, how do I manage a team? Because, you know, it was just me in the classroom. How do like, what are these taxes that I have to pay now? How does that work? <laughs> how do I forecast? So there was a lot more business stuff that I had to learn. Um, so yeah, if you're starting your business, some people, they're fortunate, they kaboom right away, but that's not typically what happens. You know, typically in the beginning, you're really kind of gathering intel and, you know, don't despise humble beginnings because that is the foundation that you can grow tremendously on. It might take 15 years. It might take five years. It might take five months. But know that no one can pass the foundational stage. Excellent. Well, this is great. Well, somebody's listening right now and they are super inspired about growing a business, but they're feeling like, ah, you know, I, I, I don't like put myself out there. It feels really intimidating to start a business. What would you say to them? I would say, ask yourself, what is your like your, your minimal, vi minimally, minimal viable product. Like what is the thing that you can do in the next 24 to 48 hours to see, does this even make sense? For me, it was easy because I can just like, you know, uh, can ask my friends, does anybody want some budgeting help? Yes, me, 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 me. It's like, oh, you know, like, so then I can sit down with someone, but let's just say you have a, you have a, um, a product and it's not as easy, right? So you might post about it like on social. So I'll give you an example. My, my cousin, she was getting married 
And she noticed that they're like, huh, there's not enough um, wedding magazines that represent a diverse group of women. You know, like she was like, I want to see Indian weddings. I want to see African weddings. I want to see Korean weddings. And she she wanted to make a a, um, a, a bridal magazine uh, because she was having a big African wedding and she couldn't find any pictures to say, I want these colors and these flowers. And so she's like, I want to create a magazine that kind of like adheres to brides from different countries. And um, meanwhile, she's a she was an engineer. What does she know about magazines? Nothing. So what she did, though, was she she um, taught herself a little bit of Photoshop, mocked up a pretend cover and put it on social media. And and um, she called it Munaluchi Bridal Magazine. And she said, um, you know, I'm thinking about making a magazine for for women from other different countries to showcase all, all these weddings from other countries. What do you what do you guys think? And the, the response was so tremendous that so she didn't have to spend all this money on printing the magazine, doing all these things, she was able to see right away, like, oh, oh, the response is tremendous. Maybe there's something here. And so when she finally, she did her first magazine and she didn't know how many to print. She somehow convinced Barnes and Nobles to carry it because they didn't have really um, uh, bridal magazines with, with um, from you know, for like um, international bridal magazines. And they told her, don't print very many. She printed 10,000. And they told her, you're a fool because we, what are we gonna do with 10,000? It sold out in three days. They were like, please tell us you have more. And she was like, no, you t- <laughs> I don't, you know. And so because what they didn't understand was that there were so many women who were, even if they were born here, maybe their grandmother was Korean and really wanted to have a Korean element to their wedding. Maybe their aunt was African and maybe one that had an African element to their wedding, but there was no representation in other magazines to show them how to do so. Because also too, if you ever see a woman that's about to get married, she doesn't just get one magazine. She's like, I'm going to get Munaluchi. I'm going to get Bride Magazine. I'm going to get The Knot. I'm going to get, she's getting five or six. So her magazine sold out. And, and, and another thing I would think of do is consider doing some crowdfunding. I have a friend named Unique and Unique had this really fun idea for a game. So, you know, like, um, Andy, I don't know if, you, like, um, if you've ever seen like um, LOL, Laugh Out Loud, or, um, you know, like, I don't know, some of the ones like, cause my, um, my stepdaughter is 14 and I'm like, I don't know what that means, but she made a game with those letters. She calls it culture tags. It's so basically a hashtag game where the hashtag is on one side and on the back, it tells you what the phrase is and you have to get someone to guess the phrase. She wasn't sure when people really play this. So she used, um, uh, what are those things called? Like, uh, index cards. She made it. And then at the next family reunion, she played it. Her family loved it. Then she played it. She went to her friend's house and said, I have a game. You want to play? She played it. They loved it. She was still nervous. Like, well, I don't know because it's a physical product. I don't know if I should make a game. So what she did was she did a Kickstarter and she got one prototype made, which was less expensive. And she did a Kickstarter and said, you know, I want to make this game. She did videos of the game so people could see it. Um, If you think you'd be interested, you know, if you, you know, donate whatever, $35, you get a game. And so I think she raised maybe like, I want to say like $15,000. And she was like, okay, there's something here. So she used that money to make the game, but then also went to um, Target to say, there's an audience for this game. Do you know, Andy, that now her game in less than one year, and this is not typical, less than one year, her game is in all, I think there's 1,500 Targets, all 1,500 Targets. If you go to Target right now and you go to the game section, you'll see this yellow box called Culture Tags. And then on top of that, Walmart just picked it up. Somebody said that this should be a game show and that that might be so. So can you imagine you have this amazing dream inside of you? You have this amazing goal inside of you. And you might think to yourself, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's viable. Do a pretest, whether it's a mock-up of it. I don't care. It, like unique use um, index cards. Like what is the basic premise of it? You know, um, if you're not sure if your bakery would do well, make bake, make um cakes for your for your cousin's birthdays for the next six months and see if people enjoy those cakes. Dip your baby toe in, see if it's viable, and then grow from there. No one starts off, you know, um big. Everyone starts off um really small. So you're literally starting off the same place that that all the greats started off and and, and you can be included in the greats. I just want you to take that step. I love that. I think that's a really good point. Uh, looking at somebody maybe where you are today, uh, Tiffany, and trying to compare yourself to your situation mm-hmm. as opposed to where you started, people can get yes. kind of confused with that. So that, that's a really good point. Let's talk to somebody who's also listening, and maybe they're in that financial rough spot that you were in, you know, sitting on your childhood bed thinking about life. What's mm-hmm. one piece of advice you'd give to them today so they can start to build the life they've always wanted? So honestly, I would say find your Linda 
it seems like I know you're thinking of like the financial component, but it's going to be very difficult to get to the financial component until you let go of that shame. So find your Linda, meaning a safe space, mom, dad, cousin, best friend, work husband, whoever, to share, you know, like the struggle that you're going through financially. You're not asking for, for um, money. You are just looking to give voice to like what you've been afraid to say. So because in doing so, I promise you, it's going to let you, it's going to help you to relieve some of that. And once you, once you relieve some of that stress and pressure, then I want you to sit down and, and write down all that's really happening. I'm losing my house to foreclosure. I've got $35,000 in credit card debt. Um, my student loan debt is this, because then we can start to make a plan. So losing house to foreclosure, is there anything I can do about it? You know, there's um programs, like I think it's like, um not NACA, I forgot the name, but HUD has a program. For example, if you're losing your house that you could reach out to, that they help people save their houses. There's no guarantee, but they certainly help people. But you wouldn't know that because you're bottling all that up inside. But now you can look at it on the paper like, okay, I'm going to reach out to HUD tomorrow. Because that's what I did. After I spoke with Linda, I made my list. And then I, I literally Googled losing my house. What can I do? And and then, you know, then it was like this HUD program popped up. So I called them to see like what's available. Then was like $52,000 in student loan debt. I was like, there's nothing you could do about it. Thankfully, my student loan debt was was federal. So I was able to call and say, what do I do if I can't afford? They're like, you can put it into deferment, um, forbearance. And I said, okay, what do I have to do to do that? They're like, are you having financial hardship? I said, yes. She said, well, then you're in forbearance. <laughs> I was like, oh, wait. Oh, okay. And then the credit card debt. That wasn't something that was going to go away so easily, but I knew, okay, I'm going to create a system to pay off this credit card debt. And I use, like what I said, like um, the snowball method, which is when you pay off the lowest balances of your debt first and then roll it over to the, um, roll over that full payment once you pay off the first debt to the second debt. So I use it. It was slow going, but I use the snowball method in order to pay off, um, but in order to pay off my, my credit card debt. But it started with finding my Linda, releasing that shame writing down all that was happening and taking it line by line and saying, instead of what's happening, what can I do? And sometimes what I can I do, like the bank who, who took my house, they were not nice. You know, they were like, literally, I would go out to look for work and come back and there'd be a lockbox on my house. Um, the bank has since been sued because they were doing that illegally. What they were hoping to do is for you to abandon the property so then they can go to court. Because in New Jersey, it's not so easy to... Um, to eject someone from their house. Like some places you don't pay your mortgage for two months or even just like, yeah, for two months, they can come take your house. New Jersey's not that way. You have to go to court and the system is a, it's a long, so it might be nine months, 12 months before the bank is able to take the house from you that you haven't paid for. But so they knew that. And so they said, well, maybe we, and they did this unfortunately to people and it worked. Maybe if we can put a lockbox, she'll leave the house and we can say, hey judge, we actually don't need to go to court. Look, she abandoned the property. Thankfully, you know, I, a friend of mine was an attorney and I told her what happened. She's like, no, 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 that's illegal. And so like, um, I, you know, I called them and I told them like, you know, it's illegal. I live here. I currently live here. My things are still inside and you don't have any, it wasn't like you don't have a sheriff's letter, you know, and they didn't. And so they had to come and, and take the, um, and take the, um, the lock off. That's why it's so important to share the shame because what if I had not told my friend Michaela, who's an attorney, I could have just lost all my stuff and walked away afraid to say something. So it's so, I cannot express, overly express it. I have this online group called Dream Catchers, Live Richer with the Budgetista. There's like 500,000 of us. It's mostly women. There's a handful of men. Men are wanting to learn financial education too. Um, and like I said, we don't turn anyone away. But because there's some people who are like, I can't find my Linda. And so I created Dream Catchers because I wanted to have a space where you could find your Linda. People share what they're struggling with. And then your peers kind of come in and give suggestions, especially people who have been there, done that. Like, hey, you know, my car broke down and I'm not sure what to do. And, you know, cause I can't afford it. Someone might come in and say, hey, there's a program that I use that helps with that. And so, yeah, find your Linda, write down where you currently are and create a plan for a, just a next steps plan. You don't have to think it all the way through. Just what can I do next? for all those things on your list. I love that. And I like how you you caveated the whole thing with this isn't this isn't just some money decision you're going to make to solve mm -hmm. your problems. These are tangible things that you can do that will give you I guess emotional relief and permission to say, mm -hmm. "Hey, this is okay. Let's move forward and try to create the life that we've always wanted. Tiffany, mm -hmm. this has been fantastic. I love speaking with you. Tell us where people can buy your new book. And obviously, we want, people are listening to a podcast right now. Where can people listen to Brown Ambition? 
So Brown Ambition is on all this, all the platforms. You can go to brownambitionpodcast.com, uh, but it's on, you know, uh, Stitcher, Spotify, all the platforms. Um, just type in Brown Ambition and you'll see myself and my my um, co-host Mandy. In Brown Ambition, we talk about uh, money, finance, careers, um, yeah, and just like what it's like to to navigate these things as a, as as brown women. My book, Get Good with Money, it's 10 Simple Steps to Becoming Financially Whole, and it's available at Get goodwithmoney.com. So if you, to me, that it's a perfect book, Andy, if you're someone who is like, like, I always tell me that people, people hit me up when, um, when they're afraid something's happened, you know, they got that bill, you know, the, 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 the mortgage company has called whatever that is like, you know, where they know, I don't know what to do now. It's perfect for you. If you're in that situation, it's perfect for you. If you have a, a student that's about to graduate college, it's perfect because if you want them to start with good habits, this is a perfect book for that. It's perfect if you're like, you know what? I feel pretty solid in, in the fundamentals, but I want to take my money to the next level. The first half of the book is the fundamentals. The next half is really building upon the fundamentals. So investing, insurance, estate planning, net worth. So it's perfect if you're wanting to go to the next level. It's perfect if you just wanted to brush up on your on your financial skills and you realize that like, you know, you could always get better. You know, I wrote this book from a place of my desire to help crack the code on what do I do with my money? How literally do I get good with my money? Not just budgeting, not just saving, but investing, but estate planning, but insurance and net worth. What financial pros should I hire? What about my debt? What about my credit? These are the 10 components. And and so I'm just really proud of it because it's really like my life's work combined. And like I said, again, it's available at getgoodwithmoney.com. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today, Tiffany. This was fantastic to learn from you and speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Andy.